<laughs> on that. Ow! Okay, wrong place to hit the table. Okay. Bye! Yes! If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays that this day and age it's sweeping the nation? Nay, it's swiffering the nation. Oh. But, uh, but only real fans, true fans, hardcore fans of this podcast who have been with, with us since day one. When we started this podcast in 1993 as a uh, BBS you had to dial in to the podcast with your yes. uh, modem and your free AOL disc. Yes. Only the real fans would know two fundamental facts about the both of us. Two very real, really real, and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest podcasting couple, uh, Bunny and Steve. For the first fact, First and foremost, the first fact about you, Bunny, is the fact that when you're not doing the show, you write greeting cards for oddly specific events. So tell us, Bunny, uh, tell us about some of the greeting cards you've been working on lately. Uh, some of the greeting cards I, I've been working on lately have, have been uh, things like, uh, sorry about your miscarriage. Um, damn turtles choking on beer rings. You know, I really, I really a like day for that. People don't realize that there is a day concerning turtles choking on on beer rings. I really liked the greeting card you wrote for uh, "Sorry, you shit your pants at a Walmart." Yes, yes. I there actually was a gave big that run one on those. Yeah, I actually gave that one to someone, and uh, I don't want to say who, but Deanna says thank you. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah, That could be any Deanna. So, could the, be any. The miscarriage one comes with a subpoena. Nice. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's tough trying to soften the blow on one of those. I mean, you've already lost yeah. your child. Yeah. Now you're in trouble with the law. You know. I liked your card. Uh, so I put so I put a I put a nice little smiley on the fetus, you know, and tried to make it look festive. You know? Yeah. But, I liked your Go ahead. Uh, I liked your I liked your greeting card. Sorry. You're a disgraced New York governor now. Oh yes, uh, I like but that one. I had to. I had to. I had to immediately shift from there, like, and start making a series. And your brother too. Yeah. Cards. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. You know, like, wow. Uh, sexual harassment in the Cuomo family. Go yeah. fucking figure. I'm sure there's still time to dig dirt on, dirt on Mario. Please. The, 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 there's such a sibling rivalry that Andrew Cuomo was a piece of shit. And then, uh, but wait, I want to be the piece of shit. Yeah. You know, that's how deep the sibling rivalry goes. Okay. And the second thing that you would know about me is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do here is I like to take a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well and reword it via my own unique storytelling style. And that's what this is. Another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's historic approximation. Dun, dun. -na -na. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wants me to or not. But anyway, this episode of Shap will be very different. I came up with a very original idea for this week's Shap. I call it, drumroll please. <laughs> did, you just, did you just get a text? <laughs> 
Is, is that what that was? No, it just uh, did the sound. Okay. W- was that a cricket? I said, uh, I said, drum roll, please. <laughs> Maxwell, that's not a drum roll. That's you knocking on a door. Come on here. Drum roll, please. Okay, that that was a little bit better, Maxwell. Okay. The Festival of Shaps. And so what this is, is a collection of three shaps that are too small to be fully formed shaps. So shap creamies, if you will. Yes. Short, sharp shaps that will brighten your day. The first ever Festival of Shaps. Are you ready? Are you pumped? Are you psyched up? Do you have a choice? Do any of us have free will? Or are we all trapped in an endless prison of our own making that we can never escape from? Does it even matter? Does any of it matter? Is anyone listening? And does anyone care? Who cares? Let's get to some shaps, you bastards! Yay! So let's do this. Shap number one. So apparently there's a London-based theater chain called View Cinemas. V-U-E Cinemas. They're huge globally. They have theaters in in the UK, Germany, Italy, Denmark, Ireland, Taiwan, Poland, and more. They were founded in 1999, so they're still fairly newish. And they currently have over 225 theaters all over the globe. So View Cinemas are big time. I didn't know that they existed, but there you go, View Cinemas. Well, apparently, they got into some trouble recently. In 2018, a 24-year-old went to the movies. I was unable to find out what movie he saw, which upsets me. But he went to the movies. A 24-year-old named Atif Rafiq went to a movie at a View-owned theater in Birmingham, England, and he sits on one of their nice seats, one of those motorized seats. You know, you got a button, and it it warms up your seat. Suddenly you have a warm butt. Yeah. There's a a theater like that in Norman, Oklahoma, and it's like, oh, I wanted to see the Joker with a warm ass cheek. Thank you. (laughs) This is exactly what I wanted. The Joker is better when your asshole is hotter. I'm not sure if you know this. It's just a fact. You should always watch Joaquin Phoenix movies with a warmed asshole. So that's, those are good seats to have. There's also a motorized footrest. So you press a button and the footrest goes... And then you can put your foot on there and you can press the button again and it goes down. So 24-year-old Atif Rafiq is, sits down on his motorized theater chair with a motorized footrest. Then he drops his phone. The phone falls under the footrest. So he reaches under the chair. He's reaching under the chair. I can't get it. It's still, it's still down there. I got to reach further. I got to get more of my hand in there. Oh, man, I, I, I almost have it. So he puts his body under the chair, and the motorized footrest lowers onto his neck, crushing his windpipe, and the man died. Death by theater seat. Can you believe that? Man. I am sh- I am shocked by this. How is this not the number one story all across America? Okay, but, okay, 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 wait, 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 wait. But you have to admit that before the man died, he gave the movie a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so there is something to this. I, I imagine, I imagine, you know, it is England. So, like, the, the movie theater seat is crushing his windpipe, and he's screaming, and the other people are like, 
Excuse me, sir. Can you please quiet down? I'm trying to watch this film. So it turns out the footrest motor blew a fuse and uh, malfunctioned, and the pressure on the man's neck was equal to three-fourths of a ton. Okay. And as a result, this past summer, in a story that Americans didn't even freaking hear about, View Cinemas was forced in court to pay the man's family to the tune of one million dollars. On a personal note, I hope that Atif Rafia, uh, Ra- Atif Rafiq, I hope he is haunting that movie theater. Yes. Like, he deserves to haunt that movie theater. I've never found myself rooting for a ghost, but damn, I hope he's haunting that movie theater like crazy. Yeah. But he was killed by a movie theater seat. Everyone should be talking about this. And uh, hold on, Bunny. Yes, Maxwell? I'm this in the road. You found this in the road. Changing to flats, cruelty-free, talc-free, paraben-free. <laughs> what is this? I have it no just idea. says MS-205 changing to flats. And then it says cruelty-free. Your head is gone. It, it head has is- zinc and cocoa and seed butter in it. I just found it on the road. May contain titanium the dioxide. The fuck is seed butter? I have no idea. Does it come from uh, seed pickles? Seed butter. It sounds it's, very vegan. The he found this like cap. It's almost like a bottle cap, but it says in big bold letters changing to flats. So then it seems like this is some sort of like a like a like a thing to change a flat tire, but then it says cruelty free. So it's like what? Cruelty to the cars? I'm so confused. Here, take that. I, I might Google some of that later. Uh, yeah. So a man in England was killed by a movie theater. Uh, I would like to learn more. About the, the thing next. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll try and figure that out during the break. Maxwell, bring that back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bing it during the break. So that was Shap number one. Here, yeah, um, okay, but, but just final word that that poor bastard not only died in a movie theater, but he just got upstaged by a bottle cap you get found in the road. Yeah, I'm sorry, Atif Rafi, but I need to figure out what changing to flats is. Uh, so we're going to get to the bottom of that during the break, so be sure and look for that in <laughs> Part in Act Three. So here comes the second chap, and I'm really proud of this one. Uh, Robert De Niro. Okay. Legendary actor, Oscar winner, director, uh, uh, activist. I don't know what he is, but I assume every actor is an activist. Yeah. And I'm right probably 75% of the time. So activist. Robert De Niro. He's also a method actor who really, really gets into his roles. Uh, but cases... I must say, okay, it's much hmm. easier to be an activist when you could just hire a couple of people to go protest for you. Yeah, it's you know? it's must it's much easier to be an activist when you have millions of dollars. Yeah, which says something about activism, but. Uh, so, Robert De Niro, he's a method actor. He can afford to buy his own rubber bullets. Yeah. Case in point, in preparation for his role as Travis Bickle in the 1976 film Taxi Driver, Robert De Niro studied, got his taxi driver's license, and actually drove a taxi in New York City, working 8- to 14-hour shifts for weeks to prepare for his role. 
Yeah. And he wasn't one million percent famous back then. Yeah. So you could have been in New York and hailed a taxi and Robert De Niro picked you up and you would not have known that it was legendary actor Robert De Niro who picked you up at 1 a.m. from the bar because yeah. he was studying for his role in Taxi Driver. But that's not all. For his role in the movie The Untouchables, he spent three weeks not touching anything. Whoa! <laughs> Talk about dedication. Yeah, that is. For his role in Backdraft, he kept all the doors and windows open in his house for weeks to let in drafts. Yes. What? That is dedication. And here's, here's, here's the biggest one he ever did. For his most memorable role as fearless leader in the live-action Rocky and Bullwinkle movie, Robert De Niro spent three entire months as a ruthless dictator of a nondescript European nation. Talk about dedication! Yes. Wow! Incredible! And, and, uh... And, and frightening in a way. I mean, you know, yeah. there, there's a line. Yeah. You can be too dedicated. You know? Yeah, when you think of Robert De Niro, you think The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle, Backdraft, and then somewhere on the bottom, I don't know, uh, Godfather 5, I don't know. One of those Godfathers. Yeah. And then Taxi Driver. I am a big fan of his role in Taxi Driver 2, Uber Driver. Yes. Which I think is, is a better movie in many ways. Now, here is the third chap. And this is the one I was actually going to do as the regular chap, but I felt that it was just too short. So that's why I decided to do the Festival of Shaps, because this is not a fully a full length shap, but this is still a powerful one that I want to talk about. I don't think that everyone hates Kevin Costner, but everyone should hate Kevin Costner. OK. And so here is a here is the reason why. So and this fits in so well with our month. So they're making the movie Tombstone. Okay, yes. And I like the movie Tombstone. I've seen it a number of times, and I like the film, but I was never super into Tombstone because I've been to Tombstone a number of times, yeah. and there are motherfuckers that are obsessed with Tombstone the movie and Tombstone the place. And it, it, when you... When you when you've been to Tombstone so many times, I don't know. It's it's weird because there's a street in Tombstone that is exactly 100% exactly the way that it's always been. Yeah. So you're just, you drive into Tombstone and go, hey, hey, there's a Circle K. Let's turn. Hey, there's a, there's a McDonald's. Hey, let's turn here. Suddenly there's no road. Everyone's on horses and everyone has guns. It's real fucking weird. Yeah. There's just one street that is 100% exactly the same with the exact same buildings, the exact same everything. There's a, oh, hey, there's a Circle K. Hey, there's a McDonald's. Hey, there's a Taco Bell. Hey, there's Boot Hill fucking cemetery right there. And there's a Kmart. So <laughs> it, it, it's real fucking weird. So they're making the movie Tombstone. And the filmmakers announce, oh, have we got a cast? Man, we have got a crazy cast lined up. Oh, man, we've got Val Kilmer. We've got this guy. We've got this other person. And then the star of the movie, uh, a huge star, probably the top star of the day, the star of Tombstone, Mr. Kevin Costner. <laughs> So they're about to start filming when Kevin Costner, being Kevin Costner, uh, he says, uh, hey, guys, uh, so I looked at the script and I, uh, I noticed that this is an ensemble picture. <laughs> I don't have that many lines. I, I have some lines. I am a star, but I'm not the star. Yeah. What gives? And 
the filmmakers go, well, yeah, I mean, this is a film about the shootout at the OK Corral, and that's not about one person. It's about a group of people. So, yeah, this movie has to be uh, about a bunch of different people. This is, at its heart, an ensemble film. You can't do the story of the OK Corral and just focus on one person. And Kevin Costner, being Kevin Costner, pulls a Kevin Costner. Yes. So you mean to tell me I'm not the one star of this goddamn movie? Do you know who I am? I am Kevin fucking Costner. I am the star. I am the focus. I get top billing. I don't share the spotlight with a bunch of other sons of bitches. That's it. I'm out of here. And so he leaves Tombstone and immediately starts making the film Wyatt Earp. Literally. That people talk about until this fucking day. And he makes it out of spite. Because they said, oh, you can't make a movie about the OK Corral just starring about one person. And he's like, the fuck I can't. Fuck you, Kevin Costner movie star. One person, Kevin Costner. And that's it. I'm not sharing top billing with these other sons of bitches. So yeah, he literally made Wyatt Earp out of spite, which is why in a six-month period of time, Tombstone came out, a film about the shootout at the OK Corral, and then six months later, Wyatt Earp, a film about the shootout at the OK Corral, but this time through the lens of just one fucking guy. Well, you know, but Kevin Costner made his bet, and and he won, because Wyatt Earp is the movie that just everybody has talked about all through time since it was made, about what a, an amazing movie. Sure, cinephiles like us are able to focus more in on Tombstone, you know, but like yeah. half handful of people know about Tombstone. Tombstone's a great fucking movie. I love that movie. Yeah. But, uh, and that's not all, because Kevin Costner, while he was making Wild Earth, tried to use his Oscar clout to stop Tombstone from being released. <laughs> what a dick. What a dick Kevin Costner is. He deserved Waterworld. Yes. No wonder an actor with the world's biggest ego starred in the 2008 film Swing Vote, a film where the results of an entire presidential election come down somehow to just one guy's vote. Oh, look at this. Kevin Costner is now the most important man in the whole country. Of course he starred in Swing Vote. Seriously? Fuck. Kevin Costner. Yes. The bright side of this mini shaft is that Tombstone costs only $25 million to make. It was a very cheap film. It does help at the fact that the set is literally already built because the street is still fucking there. Yes. Fucking crazy. That it's just a, a, just a small city that could be anywhere, but there's one mile of street that is exactly the same as it has been since 1899. It's fucking weird. <laughs> but uh, Tombstone costs 25 million, which isn't a lot as far as Hollywood movies go, and it made 57 million dollars, whereas Wyatt Earp costs 63 million dollars to make. And only made $25 million. It's like they switched. That like, hey, we made Tombstone for a small amount and made this large amount of money. And then Wyatt Earp did, hey, we're making Wyatt Earp for this large amount of money. And we made a small amount of money. So 
It, the only positive that comes from this shaft is that uh, box office wise, Wyatt Earp was a big box office bomb. So it couldn't have happened to a better person. No, no. And really, what's Kevin Costner up to these days? No clue. But that's it for our first show somewhere. I don't know. Probably. Everybody has a show. You know, motherfucker, we have a show somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I've got a couple. So it's 21st century. We all have a show somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's weird. That's really weird when you think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's it for our first ever Festival of Shafts. Three short shafts that I've been waiting to do, but were too short to become a full shaft. I really like that last one. Remember, kids, Kevin Costner is a douchebag. Yes. So he join is. us next week for some more educationally uneducational fun with Steve's Historic Approximations. And cut on.